Sunday afternoon, September 3rd, 1939, my brother and I were walking to church accompanied by our mother, father, our aunt, and our uncle to attend an afternoon service known as the benediction of the Blessed Sacrament. I was four and a half years old and my brother was more than two years younger than I. As we passed the local store, the owner was listening to the news on the Prescott radio. A radio was a novelty in our village, as very few people had one. Imagine how awesome it was for a young lad my age to discover such a gadget in a car, let alone in a car belonging to a priest. The storekeeper called to my parents to come and listen to the news. My parents accepted the invitation, and so for the first time in my life, I heard the car talking. But since it was in a language that I did not understand, I had no idea what was being said. The discussion that followed between my parents and the store owner mystified me even more. Germany had invaded Poland, and England had declared war on Germany. Canada, and by extension the Acadian fishing village where I lived, had done likewise. The world was I at war, and I was about to learn exactly what that meant. Until that moment, my world was triangular in shape. Pinkney's point on one corner of the triangle extended to Yarmouth, which formed a second angle. From there it progressed to Sluice Point, where my mother was born, and then back to where it started. This small world of mine was on the verge of becoming very large indeed. Belgium, Holland, Italy, and many other nations soon became everyday common names. As I grew older, I realized that the world extended far beyond my little triangle. Soon after the declaration of war, young men barely of required minimum age enlisted and were sent away for training. When they returned to the village several weeks later, their posture and composures had changed. They seemed eager to be sent to battle. When there were no more volunteers, conscription came and my uncle was drafted. It was only when he arrived home on his embarkation leave that I became fully aware of the situation. To see the sorrow expressed by the flow of tears in my family's eyes made me realize the dangers that awaited these men. I was barely seven years old. When the army asked my grandfather if they could use this field for target practice, he had no objection providing his cranberry bogs were not damaged. Soon thereafter, several half-drikes loaded with soldiers in full battle dress descended on the point and headed straight towards Birch Head. With the trucks fully inside of the house, men jumped out carrying ammunition and targets. The targets were installed at the bottom of the nearby hill. When the shooting started, we determined the soldiers to be no further away than our back pasture. Later in the day, the equipment was reloaded into the path tracks and the clattering motor began and it became apparent that the army was heading back home. When they passed our house, three vehicles stopped with the remainders of the fleet coming to rest just down the road. What an awesome sight that was! One of the soldiers climbed down and spoke to my grandfather. We could not hear what he was saying, but we saw my grandfather's rubbing his mustache and nodding his head. He walked towards the stable and opened the door. An army of men disembarked from the vehicles, unloaded the targets, and carried them inside where these items would be stored until needed again. Much to my mother's dismay, the only bathroom in the house shared much the same space in the stable. Every time she availed herself of the facilities, she faced these instruments of war. 
Perhaps she was afraid that some unexploded bullet awaited her passage and would blow up in front of her. Or perhaps it was just the thought that these men were training to shoot other men. We will never know. From that moment on, however, she needed someone to accompany her every time she set foot in the stable. Dad was elected after hours, but either my brother or I had the job during the day. The targets were stored on our property for about six weeks and were used many times during that period. Soon after the war was declared, an airport was built in Yermit and was divided into two distinct camps. One camp housed the British airmen and the other housed the Canadian. The airport was designed to handle training on the Avro Lancaster Long Range Bomber, the largest air aircraft designed by the British at the time. Since these aircraft were sluggish on takeoff, the two separate runaways had to be very long. How many of these bombers were stationed in Europe is difficult to establish, but I have seen as many as seven or eight flying in formation at a very low attitude. For a young boy of my age, it was a scary sight to behold. Gannet Rock, an uninhabited island located about nine miles from Pinckney's Point, was precisely the target of Lancaster pilots long to discover. Were these aircraft ever loaded with live bombs? Most definitely. In an awesome display of sight and sound, we witnessed countless explosions on Gannet Rock from the safety of our home. While many exploded in the seas, many made direct hit on the island. Once a nesting place for gannets, by the time the war was over, these unfortunate birds had migrated elsewhere. None has been seen since on the island and for many years. When the war ended in 1945, I was just a few months older than my youngest grandchild is today. For the adults like my parents, it must have been a time of much fear and anxiety. Having so many warlike exercises underway in such a small village must have been nerve-wracking. Surprising though, everyone seemed to take it in, in its stride. I am older today than my grandfather was at the time of the war, and after a long professional career elsewhere in Canada, I retired back to this very same village in which I was raised. In many ways, the pace of life here resembles the pace of life both before and after the war. But the war years, they were different. The young men were becoming soldiers, endless target practices in the pastures, my mother's fear of the stable and the thunderous drone of bombers overhead impacted my young life in ways I will never comprehend. I wish my grandchildren never have to experience the horror and loss the war inflicts. But to the child listening to a car radio outside the local store on that fateful day in 1939, it was the start of an adventure that has forever remained firmly in my memory. Determination to honor her pledges and meet her treaty obligations become involved in war. This morning, the king, speaking to his peoples at home and across the sea, appealed to all to make their own the cause of freedom which Britain again has taken up. Canada has already answered that call. On Friday last, the government speaking on behalf of the Canadian people announced that in the event of the United Kingdom becoming engaged in war in the effort to resist aggression, they would, as soon as Parliament meets, seek its authority for effective cooperation by Canada at the side of Britain.